On today's episode, Matt's PHT success story. Welcome to the podcast, helping you overcome your proximal hamstring tendinopathy. This podcast is designed to help you understand this condition, learn the most effective evidence-based treatments, and of course, bust the widespread misconceptions. My name is Brody Sharp. I'm an online physiotherapist, recreational athlete, creator of the Run Smarter series, and a chronic proximal hamstring tendinopathy battler. Whether you are an athlete or not, this podcast will educate and empower you in taking the right steps to overcome this horrible condition. So let's give you the right knowledge along with practical takeaways in today's lesson. I always love bringing success stories and today is no exception. Um, Matt is on the show to talk about his journey, uh, first of all, developing PHT and struggling with it for a bit, overcome it. And I think listening to his story, there's about six or seven key lessons to overcoming PHT. And it's all just blended into one good story. So we cover all those lessons. Uh, we sort of break them all down and you're just going to love this one. Matt was great to have on the podcast and you're going to love his journey. So let's take it away. Matt, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks uh, thanks for having me, Brody. I'm honored. Any success story uh, more than willing to jump on and have a chat about you know, your particular story and um, I'm happy to dive in. So I guess we can set the scene by just introducing yourself and uh, I guess your athletic backgrounds, which resulted in the injury. Yeah. So uh, my name is Matt. I'm um, from Montreal, Canada. So I'm French Canadian. That's where the French accent is from. Um, I'm 40 years old. Um, in my 20s, I cycled and cross country skied competitively. Um, and then when I was about 32, I switched to, to running. Uh, I train about uh, seven hours a week, more or less. Um, and I'm currently training for a 10K and a half marathon in the spring. Okay. Why the change from cycling and skiing into running? Um, I, when I was cycling and, and cross-country skiing, I, I think I wanted to, to just see how far I could go. Um, and then when I reached sort of my early 30s, I was like, I'm packing it in. I think, uh, I, think I did what I could in, in those sports. And I just decided to focus more on, uh, on work. So I, I, um, I run a translation company. Uh, so I just sort of built up the company and, uh, um, and I think like for a lot of people who switch from those, from those sports, cycling, especially or triathlon to more just running is, uh, is sort of lack of time. Uh, mm -hmm. the, like the three hour training sessions are no longer an option. So, so I've always enjoyed running. Um, and we ran the mile when I was in high school. That was a, that was a big thing every year. And I really enjoyed that. So, so I was happy to, uh, yeah, just to, to switch to running at that point. Hmm. Well, we're going to dive into the, the PHT stuff in a second, but just out of curiosity, was there any other running related injuries that you had any significant running related injuries prior to getting the PHT? Yeah. So, um, I've had, I think I've had like most, most injuries. I never had any like knee problems or plantar fasciitis problems, but I think, I think all the others I've, I've had, uh, so I'm one of those runners. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, shin splits, uh, uh, basically just the whole list. I've, I think I've gone through them. Uh, but PHT was the one that, uh, stuck with me the longest. So I had it for like about a year, but we'll, I'm sure we'll have it. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. Yeah. Let's dive into that now. Like, I guess at the moment of, the symptoms first arising, uh, can you pinpoint exactly what it was within your training uh, or surrounding those circumstances that might have sort of been a cause or been a link to the PHT developing? Yeah, so it was like really crystal clear. Um, I, uh, I signed up for a retreat in a, in a, a sort of mountain village near uh, Montreal. Uh, it was a month long. And uh, one of the reasons I went there was for, for the trail so I could, you know, I was going to run more in a different environment. And so I was just really excited. It was like just a whole new playground for me. Um, so I increased my training volume significantly, probably 30 to 50%, um, a lot more hill running. So uphill, downhill, um, a 
lot more frequent ones, frequent runs. So when you're at these things, you know, you have nothing to do. So you run in the morning and then you run in the afternoon again. And as soon as you feel okay, you're running again. Um, so I did all that while maintaining my regular sort of two times a week, higher intensity sessions. And as of like the third, third week of the retreat, I could feel like, oh, I could feel like I could start to feel my hamstring, uh, more and more. Um, but I just figured I'd just push through till the end of it and then hope to recover when I was, you know, when I was back at home. Yeah. A few things there, like the, the elements when it comes to, okay, training volume, uh, we know that mostly PHT, like most running related injuries is, uh, load dependent. It's, it's an overload of that joint Mm -hmm. or that structure. And not only were you picking up, it seems like if you were doing say two speed sessions per week, you could maybe negotiate that or successfully overcome that when there was recovery sessions outside of that throughout the rest of the week. But it almost seems like you sort of maintained your intensity twice a week. Like that was unchanged, but what did change was all those sort of lower intensity or recovery rest sessions around those sessions, which means that there's less time to recover. And therefore, when it comes to the speed work and the the harder work that you just weren't getting the recovery that you needed. Um, would that make sense? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds exactly right. And then one little thing I wanted to add, because I think this may be relevant for some of your listeners. I'm one of those uh, sort of running geeks that likes to read a lot about running and um, and experiment different things. And I'm, you know, constantly tweaking stuff and trying stuff out. And, uh, I think at, at this point I was reading a book, um, that, uh, encouraged like making adjustments to running form. And, and, and this one involved like a little bit more kickback. So like sort of kicking back mm. a little bit more. And, um, I think that really significantly increased the load, uh, on the hamstrings. So I think that was yeah. like another factor. Were you increasing your running speed as you were trying this kickback routine or do you think it was staying probably the same intensity and speed? It was, it was staying sort of constant. I was just sort of focusing on this sort of this different, this sort of different form. Um, And I think I just wasn't, you know, wasn't used to bearing that load. And I think just micro adjustments to the way you're moving. And I think any kind of conscious, conscious like form modification uh, can really alter the load that your muscles and, and, and tendons carry. So, uh, so I, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. Um, most of these things comes down to overall training volume. Like you said, there was, there's moments in there where running more frequently, sometimes running multiple times a day, um, running hills and just the overall volume pick up by 30 to 50%, how much relevance is there with the change in technique? You know, there might be some, mm-hmm. there might, yeah. it might be like a 10% influence, but mm. I'd say like the, the 80% influence yeah. would be that overall training volume. Yeah, so, that was, yeah def- definitely the, the, the main factor. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also hard to say, it's also hard to know when you've combined or added in or changed so many variables and then you end up with an injury. It's hard to know what the relevance is, but just yeah. speaking from, I guess, my understanding of the pathology, um, I would probably place those percentages to to those factors. Um, Okay. So you said the hamstring started getting tight. You started noticing a little bit of soreness there, but you decide, okay, well, while I'm at this retreat, might as well just push through, um, see how I go. And then after the the retreat, spend some time on recovery and finally sorting this out. So how did that pan out? So not well. Uh, So, (laughs) So I, I came back and I, I was like, I, you know, reduced the training volume significantly. Um, and uh, it just, it just lingered. Um, it lingered um, and it was compounded by sitting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was one of those injuries where caused by running, but then everyday life activities like makes it worse. Uh, so sitting made it worse. Um, and I reduced the training volume, but I was maintaining the intensity. And I think at this point, like my hamstrings weren't, weren't tolerating that. And so, um, yeah, so it just, it just hung around for, uh, for over a year. Were you noticing it during the running as well, or was it only just after and sitting for the remainder of the day? 
Um, it varied, I think for, for a lot of people, it, uh, it varies. Like some days you don't feel at all. Other days you really feel it. Um, it's a really annoying injury in that sense. It's like really a soul sucking injury. It's like, it's always, you know, it's either there, you, you feel it, or it's lurking in the background, like, you know, going to flare up. Um, so basically I felt it when running less when I was running slow, I could really feel it any kind of, anytime I'd increase the speed, I really felt it more. Um, I felt it resitting. I felt it anytime I'd be like reaching down, you know, tying my shoelaces. Um, I'd feel it there as well. Um, it was basically, I mean, you've had it. It's really, uh, it's really an annoying injury. And, and yeah. I think the worst thing is, um, uh, is this sort of feeling of helplessness. Like, uh, you know, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried this, and it's just keeps coming back. You feel like I may be stuck with this for my whole life. Um, so, um, yeah, so I feel a lot of, uh, compassion for anyone, anyone who's had this, anyone who's listening. And I hope that, you know, maybe something during this podcast can, can give you hope and, and help to, to resolve the issue. Yeah. And like you said, uh, you're saying to yourself, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried this. Um, you briefly mentioned that one of your attempts was to reduce your overall volume and maintain the intensity was there anything else that you might have tried within that year to, you know, kick this injury? Yeah, so I went, I went to physio, um, and it was, uh, it was, it was correctly diagnosed. So I think that's something. I mean, like from from what I hear, is that a lot of people have, have trouble with. So they go see a mm-hmm. physio, and then they get diagnosed for something like piriformis syndrome or something sort of not at all related. Um, so I was lucky. I went to a, a physio who specializes in uh, running injuries. And I think that was really key to getting a proper diagnosis. Um, so I was, um, I was properly diagnosed and I was given to start off um, light strengthening exercises. Um, and, and I did those and um, I saw a lot of improvements with those exercises. Um, but what I did and which I now know is wrong is as soon as it sort of started to recede, I stopped the exercises. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then it would flare up again. And in my mind, it was, um, to to me, like I, I equated that with that strength is not the issue. It's something else. If I'm strengthening and then it keeps coming back, it must be something else. Yeah. How far? How long had you had this injury for before you eventually went to the physio and started these light exercises? I I went I went to quite early, and then and then I went to another one, and then I went to another one, and then I eventually went back to the first one. Okay, um, All right, bit of a journey there. So, yeah, so so because I tried the strengthening, I was like, oh, it must be something else. Mm. Um, and, uh, and eventually I think I went sort of full circle, um, and, and I listened to your podcast and then, and then, so the success stories and I, and then there was one episode with where, or one or two, at least, uh, where you're talking, um, just more, uh, directly about PhD. Um, and that really, that really changed everything for me. Okay. Well, let's get a little bit more, um, I guess, practical and dive into the exact exercises because I'm curious to know, you said you'd, you start some light strengthening exercises and you found initial success. Um, what, what were those that you included? Yeah, super happy to share about that. So um, the light, what I, what, I, what I was given first was um, an isometric uh, hamstring hold, I guess you could describe it. It's like you're lying on your back, with your feet on a chair. Mm -hmm. And you just raise your bum slightly and then that works the hamstrings. And it was like, hold that for 30 seconds and, uh, and then do that maybe like five times. So super light. Um, and, um, and then I did those and then running was going a lot better. And then I just, I just stopped. And that was, that was my mistake. It's, it's interesting how people interpret these things. Like even just doing something as simple as that and feeling a lot better and then once you feel a lot better you stop doing them and then yeah. because symptoms return you sort of interpret that as okay the exercises were no good but exactly 
Exactly. You can, you can easily flip the script and interpret a different way and saying, all I'm doing is this one exercise and I'm feeling better. You know, maybe it is something to do with strengthening or maybe this might help move the needle once you sort of move, uh, I guess, into that same direction just with progressions and yeah. maybe different exercises, newer exercises, uh, make it more challenging and then see yeah. what that is like. But that's a really nice lesson because there'd be a lot of people listening now that would interpret that situation the same way. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to add is that the running, the the strength training tended to make the running more uncomfortable because you get a bit of soreness. Mm-hmm. And so, so the strength is like a little bit annoying because you know, your run might be like a little bit, you know, less enjoyable because your hamstrings are a little bit more sore. So I was happy to ditch the exercises, you know, when I could. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's only when I understood um, that I had to really increase my capacity or my strength by doing different kind of, kinds of exercises, by doing more, um, and by, by leaning more into the pain. Um, it's only then that I was incre- able to increase like, my capacity and, and finally recover completely. Yeah. Did the physio give you any advice when it came to the running or were you following any particular guidelines when it came to your running to sort of manage the injury? Yeah. So the physio was fantastic. So, uh, she, she told me, uh, for the running that I should self-manage. So she didn't tell me like stop running or, or run less self-manage. And that thing that, that I think really worked really well for me. So, um, it was self-managed in the sense if the next day, you're still sore from what you did, then you did too much. So 24 hours later, after, for example, your speed session, your hamstrings are still like, you know, hurting, then you went overboard. And so, so scale back. Um, And then during the running, never go above uh, like a three on 10 pain level. I think you mentioned that as well during the podcast. Um, And during the strength exercises, maximum of five on 10 in terms of Mm -hmm. pain. Yeah. Um, so those like those limits that she gave me, they worked extremely well. And they seem to follow or fall in alignment with the podcast and sort of what we've talked about in on past episodes as well. So good to know that there's a bit of um, congruency in the, the advice that's given there. And so you mentioned that you've gone from physio to physio, physio, then back to the first physio. Uh, was there any other nuggets or any other insights, whether that be helpful or unhelpful as you tried out different physios? Um, I think the most, really the most helpful thing was uh, was from, from your podcast. And if I can, I'll maybe uh, dive into that a little bit, a little bit more in detail. Um, so the, the first thing was, and I think this seems to be a common, a common pattern with a lot of people who have PhD or other tendon issues is that they shy away from the pain. So as soon as it starts to hurt or be uncomfortable, they stop. And, and that's, that's what I was doing. Um, and so, um, when I started, when I listened to your podcast, I decided to, to sort of lean into the pain and I wasn't shying away from, I wasn't avoiding it anymore. So I started to do some work at the gym. Uh, before I was just doing sort of like Swiss ball stuff and uh, the, the, the hamstring isometric exercise I mentioned, uh, sort of the standard physio kind of usually kind of ex- or exercise that we associate with, uh, with rehab and physiotherapy. Um, so, so I went to the I signed up for the gym. I uh, hadn't been to the gym in you know a few years. And I started doing some some heavy lifting. So, um, squats, deadlifts, uh, single legged deadlifts, um, stiff leg and bent leg or regular, uh, split, split squats, step ups and, um, eccentric Swiss ball hamstring curls. Okay. Um, Swiss ball eccentric hamstring curls. Okay. So we have squats, you had deadlifts, single leg deadlifts. You mentioned some straight legged deadlifts. So there's a lot of those kind of variations, yeah. split squats, and then the exercise where you sort of do a bridge onto a Swiss ball and then you roll out eccentrically excellent. and sort of, okay. Um, yeah, excellent, exactly. Right? Yeah. And I, I might add step ups, which were really, they're sort yep. of similar to a split squat, 
uh, but step ups. Um, what I did with the uh, eccentric uh, curls was that I was lying down and then with two legs, I would roll my feet away from my body. And then, no, with, with one leg, sort of on the eccentric portion, I would roll away and then with two legs, bring it back. So I'm working just eccentrically. The, the concentric part is easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good gambit of exercises. And would you perform all of these exercises within one gym session or did you spread it out more throughout the week? I, I spread it out. So I did um, I did uh, two sessions a week. Mm -hmm. um, so at the beginning, when I was doing the sort of the light strengthening exercises, those I could do every day. Um, and that was helpful. Um, but then as I progressed, um, then I was lifting heavier and then, then I had to make the, the workouts more infrequent. So it was twice yeah. a week. That, that worked really well for me, twice a week, Monday, Thursday. Um, and uh, I did, um, I did uh, so heavy weights. So uh, five, to, or say five to six reps was, was standard. So it's like maximum strength work. Five to six reps per set and how many sets? uh maybe two or three or yeah all right less. great so you are getting quite heavy with those um back to your point as well about you know people shy away from pain yeah i think that's an excellent uh bit of advice especially because if it's only sore in the moment um you know you can really challenge yourself and like there's a you can get a lot of reassurance to know that's actually fine uh if there's pain during the exercise, but then it lingers, you know, quite substantially for hours afterwards. Maybe that's a little bit too much. So everyone has different levels of irritability. But for the most part, I find that if you are sore and there is a little bit of pain during that exercise and there's nothing that lingers afterwards, you can go quite significant. Like when I have a tendinopathy in the past, like let's just use the PHT that I used to have, I used to push my pain to like a five or a six out of 10, which I don't really recommend for most, but only because I just know myself so well and I'm happy to sort of take on those risks. Uh, I found that I even responded really well to a five or six rather than a three or four during that particular exercise because I knew that irritability like the symptoms afterwards would go back to zero straight away. And I'd feel a lot better throughout the day if I really loaded up with something quite heavy. Um, and yeah, people don't like being in pain. People shy away. They think, yeah. and understandable, think if you do a deadlift and you have this pathology in this tendon that it might cause more tears or more damage or a rupture or yeah. something like that. People are, have that inclination that might happen, but actually the opposite happens. And so- yeah. Yeah, a lot of reassurance about those sort of things is key. Yeah, that rings really true to me. And I remember listening to say that in one of your episodes that you went to five or six on 10. And uh, when I heard that, I just started like really hammering my hamstring in the gym. <laughs> um, and I think that really tipped the scale from sort of lingering and flaring up to like disappearing completely. I, I've been 100% recovered in complete remission for over six months. Um, and my, my hamstrings are like stronger than ever. Like I'm, I'm done. I'm over this. <laughs> uh, and I was suffering it from it for, for over a year. So, so that to me made a big difference as well. Um, and if I'm, if I might have just like a little piece of advice in terms of, for, for your listeners, um, what, what really helped me at least, um, in terms of exercise selection, whatever was the most uncomfortable was the most helpful. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, so if it's like, you know, if the single leg deadlifts is, is, um, uh, is like what really like, you know, really brings you to like a higher pain, pain threshold, that's the one you need to do. I think as long as it's, it's tolerable and as long as, you know, the next day you're, you know, you're, you're not worse than you were. Um, that to me, that to me, like is a good guide for, for exercise selection. Yeah. A lot of this can be. A lot of the advice that's given is quite like the opposite of what someone would intuitively do. Yeah. Like we can use yeah. pain during exercise as that sort of intuitive sense of, okay, let me stay away from that. Whereas we're steering into it. Yeah. Um, the same thing can be said for exercises. Like people can find, oh, my hamstring curls, I do those and they don't cause pain. So I'll stick to that. And 
um, all of these other exercises like a step up or a lunge or something um, causes pain. So let me just avoid those. Yeah. But to your point, we need to steer into those because recognizing yeah. that the hamstring works in different ways, different directions, under different loads, eccentrically, under compression, out of compression, concentrically, isometrically, all those sorts of things. So if you can find an exercise that really you're vulnerable to, that is yeah. a weak link that you need to get as strong as possible for you to have yeah. full recovery. And so the same thing could be said for people to say, oh, no, I'm fine running you know, really slow, but as soon as I increase my speed, the hamstring pain comes back. That again is a, a vulnerability, a weak point that we need yeah. to strengthen in order to make this condition as resilient as possible. Um, so yeah, steering into those things, it's might be tricky on your own, trying to come up with a plan to introduce speed or yeah. to modify an exercise so that we're addressing that vulnerability and eventually progressing to you know, strengthening that weak link, but yeah. needs to be done. If you want to be resilient and you don't want all these flare ups popping up every couple of yeah. weeks or a couple of months, then they do need to be tackled head on. Yeah, absolutely. The one talking about the exercise prescription side of things, yeah. uh, there's probably one exercise in there that I haven't seen and that I would probably include, which would be some sort of hamstring curl so you did yeah. mention that you're doing a bridge on the ball yeah. and you're coming back two legs which is kind of yeah. like a hamstring curl and then yeah. you're eccentrically um yeah. releasing with one leg but probably isn't that heavy progressive type of thing that i would um like it doesn't really foster that progressive environment when it comes to yeah. the hamstring curl so yeah. a prone hamstring curl with like a um, on a machine that you yeah. can sort of curl would probably be one that I would add in there to then give you a gold star for almost every single exercise yeah. that you're doing. <laughs> but uh, was there any uh, was there any advice or any inclination to do some some sort of exercise like that? Um, I think uh, I appreciate you mentioning it. I uh, I think I had like sort of that base covered with the Swiss ball one, mm. um, but in hindsight, I would have added that one. And the one I never did, but which I, you know, you keep hearing about is the uh, Nordic, is it Nordic curls? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. one. Uh, I never did that one, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah. I think I don't really prescribe the Nordic curls a lot for people. Um, they, so for those who aren't familiar, it's sort of the exercise where you're kneeling and you have your ankles secured, locked in place for um, either that be like a like you you put it under a bit of furniture or under like a weighted bar or um, those sorts of things, and then you lower yourself so you're trying to keep everywhere the whole body between your knees and your shoulders straight, stiff as a board mm -hmm. as you lower yourself down, and as you do that, you're eccentrically contracting your hamstrings, and if you try and see how far you can slowly control yourself in that descent and then once you sort of lose control then you just put out your hands and sort of catch yourself and repeat that process that is uh really working the hamstring muscle belly and working the hamstring muscle belly eccentrically um which if someone was a sprinter if if you had a runner that it mainly wants to get involved in sprinting i would 100 percent give them that exercise because that eccentric component needs to be super super strong for for runners running it at speed um but doesn't really foster compression like a squat or a deadlift or a step up um those sort of exercises which more target the upper hamstring and like sort of isolate the tendon um that the nordic drops yes very very good for the hamstring muscle and the muscle belly doesn't really do much for the tendon the higher up tendon so wh why the deadlift works really really well is people say, oh, I do the deadlift and all I do is feel my upper hamstring. Well, that's because the idea of that exercise is to localize to the upper hamstring, almost isolate the, the tendon to work, which once you foster the right conditions can do wonders for rehab of this condition, which is why I give deadlifts to almost everyone that, um, that I see. But yeah, I guess that's where it depends on the type of athlete, depends on what goals that athlete has, depending on what... Um, exercise I prescribe, but yeah, I 
probably give Nordic drops to maybe 10% of my caseload. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, any follow-ups on that particular topic? Um, on the exercises, uh, no, I think, I think I've, uh, I've given you everything I've got. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to address, you, you mentioned that you're doing these twice a week. Um, you initially started with doing all of these exercises twice a week, but then progressed to the point where it became quite heavy, quite challenging, and you had to separate them out. Um, I think that is another good lesson for people to realize because a lot of people get stuck on daily exercises, sometimes multiple times a day and simply can't progress. And they do bridges, they do hamstring curls, they might do like some isometric sort of stuff. Um, and then they do that once or twice a day and never, well, they initially see some progress because they're fostering some sort of strength, but their rate of progression plateaus and they can't progress that progression because if you try to progress those exercises and continue doing them daily, you're just going to get too sore. You need that recovery balance. And so you do naturally want to gravitate towards if you are quite weak and need to start at a real foundation level, definitely start with the easy exercises. You can do them daily, but needs to very gradually progress to the point where eventually maybe six to 10 months down the track, you're doing what Matt's doing. So heavy, heavy stuff once or twice a week and really reaping the rewards of the slow, heavy stuff. Um, any thoughts on that or would you agree? Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, I think that was really key for me. I think a lot of people, including myself, associate physio rehab exercises with the everyday sort of really annoying, soul-sucking <laughs> 25 minutes of boring exercises that you would rather not do and not with the heavy lifting in the gym. And, uh, and that from, at least for me was what really, uh, what really paid off. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you've, you've seen full recovery, um, and you've seen that, I guess, sustainability and strength and those sorts of things. Uh, what have you managed to return to or, um, alongside that, do you find that you still have any vulnerabilities or weak links when it comes to your performance? Um, I think um, uh, the gym work has made me much more resilient in general. Uh, so I haven't had any any kind of uh, any injuries that made me have to stop running or even curtail my running. Um, I've had some like and and still have some like little occasional niggles. Um, you know, little things that, uh, you know, maybe one on 10 out of, you know, in terms of pain, um, but nothing that has kept me running um, in, in the last six months. So I can, I can, I can, I can confirm that for me, uh, doing the gym work uh, twice a week, the strength work, the heavy lifting uh, has, uh, has really benefited, benefited me in terms of my resilience um, in terms of injury prevention. Yeah. And you're preparing for a 10K race at the moment. Um, what does your training volumes, uh, like days of the week, what does that look like? Um, it's about an hour a day, more or less. Um, I'll have the two strength sessions a week, uh, two harder days. So like either uh, speed work or like tempo or intervals or some sort of form of intensity. Um, and then one longer run usually, uh, which is not that long, maybe an hour and a half to maybe two hours at the moment. And then the other days are just sort of easy days. Uh, so usually about an hour, um, before the higher intensity days, I'll do usually some strides. So I'll include strides like at least two or three times a week. Um, I, uh, where I live, there's snow. So I, uh, cross country ski, um, and snowshoe a little bit as, as cross training. So I'll replace the easy days by like a cross uh, cross training day uh, sometimes. Excellent. I'm curious to hear, Matt, what are some like final takeaways, final bits of advice you might have for someone with PHT who's really struggling? Um, and y y if you have any advice for them, what would that be? Yeah, for sure. So this is uh, my favorite part of, <laughs> of our little chat because I get to you know maybe offer some 
some information that hopefully might be valuable for your listeners, because I really benefit a lot from the success stories and from your insights. So thank you very much for that. Um, maybe the first thing I could say is that um, foam rolling, massage, stretching, all those things can be helpful for certain injuries. Um, PhD is not one of them. Uh, so, so those things did not help at all um, for me. And I really tried them uh, extensively. PhD is a, is a strength or capacity problem. Um, and if you increase your capacity, uh, you'll get rid of the PhD. At least that was, that was my experience. That's, that'd be my first takeaway. Okay, foam rolling, massage, uh, you've tried them, didn't really work out well for you. Um, what else do you have? Um, to get a proper diagnosis, uh, really important to go see a physio who works with runners. That seems to be really important because that physio is going to know about this injury. He's going to know that runners get it a lot. And I think it's, it's in an area, the PhD, where it could be a lot of things. And, uh, and that, that thing, that is really key. Uh, so if there's any, any listeners who are working with a physio who isn't like specialized in running, um, I would, I would recommend that, uh, as, as something that can really, can really be a game changer. Hmm. To your point about the foam rolling, stretching, massage, like those sorts of things. Um, I do think, I want to avoid overstretching. Um, I want to avoid like similar to say running. We want to know how much you can tolerate with your running and stay running. Um, with stretching, we all have a, and sitting, we all have a certain load dependence. We all have a certain amount or a certain duration that you can tolerate. And if you like stretching, you can still stretch. It's just below what you just want to sort of hover around what you can tolerate um, otherwise you become deconditioned and some people don't like stretching, so they don't need to stretch, but some people want to return back to yoga classes or uh, Pilates and those sorts of things. And similar to sitting, sometimes sitting can be sore if you do it for too long, but you don't want to avoid sitting at the same time because then that really deconditions you um, to tolerate sitting and then trying to return back to sitting six months later is a real struggle because uh, you sort of atrophied or you sort of decondition yourself in that particular domain. Um, and the foam roller, yeah, I'm never a fan of foam rolling, particularly really high up in the hamstring where it's uh, sore because that tends to irritate things. Um, but I think it can be kind of in the category of foam rolling and massage other areas of the body if you so choose, if you so want, and if you do get some benefit from it. Um, for example, some people might like a massage of the hamstring and of the glutes, and they might feel better for a day or two. If that's you, great, continue doing it, but you don't really want to do sort of deep friction massage around the sitting bone area, just tends to irritate. So um, yeah, there's sort of like a somewhere in between, but to your point, I think a lot of people find themselves in that wrong direction. They either stretch too much and irritate, they foam roll or massage that um, sitting bone area and it further irritates. So, um, my advice as well as Matt's best to stay away. It's not really that effective. Yeah. Good stuff. So, uh, another one for me, and you mentioned it is, uh, sitting. So for me, limiting sitting was, was really helpful. Uh, like a lot of times when you're running, you tend to like, you drive somewhere. So you're sitting, you run, you irritate your hamstring, and then you sit back in the car again, then you go to work, you sit. So you're like always irritating it. Um, unloading it in that way. So reducing the sitting, uh, I almost like other than meal times, I like eliminated, I got a standing desk and, um, and that was really helpful because that allowed that reduced the load on, on the hamstring. And so allowed it to recover more, uh, between like the strength sessions and, and the running. Mm. And out of curiosity, like now, when it comes to your sitting habits and your sitting tolerance, where are you at at the moment? Absolutely. No problem. Like I, I'm absolutely no problem. Okay, good. Because a lot of people um, sometimes returning back to sitting or building up the sitting tolerance is like one of the last things to return. And okay. so it's very encouraging for people to know that you can um, sort of build up that tolerance and get back to a completely normal like day-to-day -day life with sitting and um, social events and those sorts of things. So great. Um, any other final takeaways? Um, we mentioned a little bit at the beginning uh, about running form small changes in, in running form, 
in my opinion, can make a big difference on, on the load that's applied to muscles and tendons. And um, if they're done, they should be done ideally when the overall training volume is low. Yeah, very good advice. So because there are changes to the body when you do um, make adjustments here and there, then it's good to just dial back. So you're sort of taking all of your training dials and seeing what you can manipulate to not subject yourself to an overload. Um, very, very wise words. Um, similar to like, say, speed and those sorts of things. You don't want to increase your volume and your speed at the same time. So if you say, okay, let me go see how I go with a speed session, maybe dial back your long run or maybe dial back some of your shorter recovery runs to see how you can sort of manipulate the rest of the week um, to help suit that, to make sure that that overload isn't present in there. Yeah, very good advice. Another one would be um, about speed work. Mm -hmm. Speed work to me was uh, was the last piece of the puzzle. So I, I couldn't feel the PhD anymore on my easy runs, uh, but I could still feel it when I was running faster. Um, and I feel that I think it's mentioned the in one of your podcasts the uh, the load um, increases significantly. The load on the hamstrings specifically yeah. increases like exponentially with speed work. Was it like six or seven times? Yeah, yeah. You can just see it on a graph, like slow running, and then as you sl- gradually pick up your speed, the demand in the hamstring just skyrockets. And so, I think a lot of people would agree with you that yes. Um, a hamstring, the hamstring originally came on due to speed work. That, that's very, very common for a lot of people. All of a sudden they start doing a lot of speed work and develop PhD. Um, but to your point as well, a lot of people find that I felt a lot better, starting to improve, did one speed session back, flared up, or um, similar to your circumstance, it's just that last little piece of the puzzle, that last element to your training that seems to be um, vulnerable to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it just has like, if when it's at least for me, when I reintroduced it, it was very gradual. Like I started with just, just strides, like maybe just like six strides. Um, and then eventually like some faster intervals. Um, and now, you know, now I'm able to do any kind of speed work and, and my hamstrings are not a limiter. Yeah. Excellent. Anything else? Um, we touched on a little bit before, uh, if, if you, you think you're fully recovered, keep doing the strength training. Mm. Uh, so that was, that was my big, big mistake. Uh, to me, I see it now as a, uh, your capacity is like a, a horizontal red line. Um, and if your load is below that line, you're going to be symptom free. So things are going to be, are, are we going great? Um, but as soon as you go over that line, that's where you start to feel symptoms. So you can do some strength, strength training, raise the red line. Um, but then as soon as your training load catches up with your capacity, then you start to have symptoms again. So by keeping up the strength training sort of on a continuous basis, then you're co- consistently increasing or raising that red line to make sure that you stay in remission. So that was really important for me. Yeah. I sort of have this as a, you know, it's easy to say in theory, but one of the approaches to rehab that I like is let's just raise your capacity, endurance, strength, power, plyometrics. Let's just continue raising it so that you can't possibly reach it in like your training. Like when you do your sprint sessions or when you do your deadlifts and those sorts of things, if we can raise your capacity so that you can never even get close to reaching the capacity, then, you know, you're never going to get a flare up. Um, That's overly simplistic and, it's, um, like I say, in theory, it's easy to say, but should be a goal, should be like a, a mindset for people to, okay, I'm feeling great. I'm loving my running. It's pain-free, symptom-free in the gym, but what else do I need to work on? Like, how can I progress so that I'm overall like building more and more resilience? I think that's a good mindset to have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. Um, maybe another nugget I'd have would be, um, and, and this, I, I didn't, I didn't mention it, but it was a key part of, um, of, of recovery and of the, it was like a, a turning point for me. 
um, is I started working with a coach. I've always been a self-coached athlete. And uh, six months ago, I started working with a coach. And uh, I told him I had this, uh, you know, persistent hamstring issue. And uh, I told him what my training load was. And right away, he basically cut it by 30 to 50% um, for several weeks. And um, although it's hard to say like exactly what effect that had, because like there were a lot of like variables that I was, I was playing with at the time, um, I'm confident that that had like a really, a really big impact. So by, by deloading, by decreasing my overall training volume, that allowed uh, like my, my body to allocate resources to repairing my hamstring. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if PHT is a, a, like a localized issue um, in the body, I think um, like you're a runner's general state uh, of fatigue, like the general training load or stress load, I think that can have a big effect on an injury like PHT and on the time that it lasts. So I think, I think if, if an athlete is, is self-coached and is always kind of training at the limit of what their body can tolerate, um, I think one of the things that it, that kind of athlete, which I was, can do um, is to start working with a coach. Yeah. Um, it gives that level of accountability as well. And I say this all the time, when, when you start getting better, it's the most dangerous part of your rehab because especially if you don't have a coach, you just say to yourself, yep, I'm back. Finally, let's, you know, pick up the running. Let's increase the speed. Let's, you know, introduce hills again. Let's find a race that you can prepare for. And like people just jump straight back into that and symptoms return really quickly. And so if you do have a coach and you start feeling better, you know, you've still got that accountability for someone to say, well, okay, let's follow the process. Yes, we can sprinkle in some mileage. Yes, we can sprinkle in some speed, but it needs to be the process. The process is what got you here to the symptom-free in the first place. So let's continue with the process so that we can mitigate any flare-ups or um, reduce that risk of a flare-up in the future. So yeah, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing that a coach can give you is that um, they can vary the training load more on a macro level so mm -hmm. that you have sort of longer periods where you're just kind of slowly building up um, rather than I think, I think at least for me, a self-coach athlete will tend to tend to train by feel. Okay. I'm feeling good today. I'll go run for two hours um, and do that sort of more in a more homogenous way. So week to week, it sort of it looks more, more the same. Um, and I think with a coach, we'll have a more, um, a more global sort of a more, more global vision, uh, of an athlete's training load and is able to, to vary it all, like different cycles. And I think that that is really important, especially if you have a, an injury like PHT to allow it to recover. Yeah. Well said. Um, anything else as we wrap this up? Yeah. Maybe the last one, um, would be, um, if you have PHT, at least for me, um, that's the number one limiter in your training. Like my running was going nowhere with this thing uh, because you, you tend to like run slower, not do any speed work. Um, and so if I had to like do it all over again, right from the start, I would make it my, my main focus. I think it's very difficult for runners to, you know, curtail their training uh, to, to like focus on an injury. Uh, so, and I think that, that's what like makes it worse or, or, or that's why it ends up lingering for, for months. Uh, so if, if I had to do it over again, I would make that my like first priority right from the start. I would say reduce my training load by 50%. Uh, I would reduce my running and I would start, you know, focusing more on the gym right from the start. And I would do, I would make that my priority to, um, to get rid of it because it is, it's, it's basically the number one limiter of your running. Uh, if you have it. Mm. Yeah. Well said. And I'll, I'll touch on a few of those things, but like, as we were going through this conversation, I sort of wrote down a, a few things that I wanted to commend you for. One was actually getting a membership. So getting a gym membership and starting the heavier sort of stuff. And then number two, just keeping to it. So once you did get better, 
you still stayed at the gym, still stayed doing the heavy stuff, which a lot of people don't do. So well done for doing that. And the other one was just like not shying away from the elements of your running that you know you have particular vulnerabilities to because a lot of people can say, I talk to them and they say, yep, I'm back to symptom free. I'm back to um, doing everything I love and I don't see it coming back. And I say, oh, okay, so how's your speed going? And they say, oh, no, I don't do any speed work anymore. That's not a part of my life just because I'm so scared of PhD coming back. But it seems like you've really faced this head on and returned back to strides and intervals and racing and all those mm-hmm. Um, elements to not only do what you love, but also add resilience to that tendon and add in the speed work. Once you can successfully do the speed work, then that's another chink in your armor. That's another layer of foundation that you've got in there. And so, yeah, very, very key. People always ask me like, what can I do to reduce the risk of a flare up? And if you're avoiding speed work, because you know that you have a vulnerability to it, then you're leading yourself susceptible to an element within your training that um, might bring you undone. So very, very good for doing all those sorts of things. I think there's a ton of takeaways in this, which we haven't really seen in other success stories. So this is going to help a lot of people, Matt. Thanks for coming on and sharing your story. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm overjoyed. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity. And um, I hope that, you know, your listeners will have, you know, taken some insights from this. I'd be, I'd be really happy. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks once again for listening and taking control of your rehab. If you are a runner and love learning through the podcast format, then go ahead and check out the Run Smarter podcast hosted by me. I'll include the link along with all the other links mentioned today in the show notes. So open up your device, click on the show description, and all the links will be there waiting for you. Congratulations on paving your way forward towards an empowering, pain-free future. And remember, knowledge is power.